Hi, I'm Allison Prophet with Diagnostics World, and I'm here at the Next Generation Diagnostics Summit. I got to sit down with Alex and Andrea. So Alex works with the CVS Minute Clinic, and Andrea is on the retail pharmacy side at CVS. Welcome, both of you. We talked earlier about the pharmacist, in some cases, being the longest standing healthcare provider relationship that some patients have. They've been with the pharmacist maybe for longer than any other care provider. So for both the Minute Clinic and the pharmacist, what kinds of things should people be coming to the pharmacist or the Minute Clinic for? What kinds of tests, what kinds of illnesses? What are the indications that they should think first about a Minute Clinic or a pharmacy? So I'll talk a little bit about the clinic which is a little different from the pharmacist. But I say that the, I would be an advocate that the minute clinics are a place where you could have a wide variety of point of care testing done. Mm -hmm. So we offer 10 different point of care tests now, and it's the things that you would really think of. So it's, it's strep testing, and it's flu testing, and it's adenovirus testing, which is pink eye. It determines whether it's virus or, or bacterial infection. We do things like glucose testing and lipid testing. So we're, we're looking at your cholesterol, we're looking at your glucose, we're looking at some of that testing. So if you think about the span of disease states, we're testing for minor acute uh, illness mm -hmm. in things like strep and flu, as well as testing for some chronic disease. So if you think about A1C for diabetics, we're doing that type of testing in the clinics, as well as um, the glucose testing for, uh, you know, and that could be either acute or chronic. I think that if there is a point of care test on the market and we can do it, we would take a hard look at it because the clinics we feel can really supplement primary care as well as act as not a level of emergent care that you would see in an emergency room, mm -hmm. but a place that's a, a nice alternative for somebody who's feeling sick to go have care done, and that care can be supplemented through diagnostic testing. So I think the physical space dictates some of this and staffing. It makes perfect sense that a patient could come and get a flu or strep test at a pharmacy where the pharmacist can test them and issue treatment. These are minor ailments that are acute and have very specific treatment plans. I think things like monitoring chronic disease also has a place in the pharmacy, A1C. Pharmacists certainly <laughs> understand the importance of adherence for diabetes medication, and so the ability to be able to track and help someone monitor their A1C and then counsel them on their medication would also make a, a difference. When we start to get into some other tests, things like hepatitis C, HIV, it's more an issue of do we have a quiet private space in order for this conversation to be happening? Uh, you know, hep C, HIV, these are chronic diseases, and we really have shifted, but we haven't shifted enough. And certainly that's not the kind of thing that you want to just be happening at the consultation counter. So I think those are the kinds that we would have to take a, a different look at in terms of logistics from a staffing model. Do you have enough time to work with a patient on something like that, giving someone that kind of a diagnosis versus a patient with an established diagnosis? And now you're doing a test that's just around adherence or something more minor in acute care. So when you are thinking about a point of care test, when you're considering um, incorporating that into the Minute Clinic or into the pharmacy, what kind of test are you looking for? Do they, what are the criteria? Do they need to be so fast? Do they need to be a certain size? Do they need to have a certain health outcome for you to consider using them? I think in the clinics we're looking at timing of testing results is a really big one for us. I would say the number one thing we're gonna look at is the FDA approved and is it clear waived. On top of CLIA waiver, the minute clinics right now, if it's a blood test, we're only doing finger stick capillary blood. Mm -hmm. We've avoided doing phlebotomy for a number of reasons, which I can get into later if we like, but the reality is it's challenging to do phlebotomy in a, a minute clinic right now with a single provider model. Our clinics are staffed by just one person. So in order to do that, you would need to have a single provider doing phlebotomy, and it's just a challenge if they can't get the blood for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So right now we limit our clinics to finger stick testing because you can get a finger stick. Mm -hmm. So the first couple things we look at is FDA approved, CLIA waived, finger stick blood. And then we look at test timing. So our philosophy is that the clinic visit is wrapped up all in one, one time. So mm -hmm. when you walk into and you walk out, the whole visit is completed. That includes any point of care testing done. So time to test results is a really big piece for us. So I would say anything over 20 minutes is really not feasible in our space because we have people waiting to be seen. 
preferably we'd like tests to be under 10 minutes. But you know the realities of testing right now, there's a sweet spot between 10 minutes and 20 minutes that we look at a multitude of different reasons. I mean, what are we testing for? How is it supplementing care? And then there's the reimbursement piece, and we need to just make sure that we're not losing money every time we make a test. But even if we are, if it can enhance the clinical care for our providers, it's not something we would rule out. So I'd say those are the, the top line things that we look at when we think about what we're going to use for tests in our clinics. Mm -hmm. I'd say the bottom line is that you know, if we can find a test that will supplement care to our patients and enhance our providers in diagnosing and treating our patients, we'll, we'll really take a hard look at that test and see if it's something we can offer. So in the Minute Clinic, I know you've got dedicated space. And downstairs in the Expo Hall, there's a nice, really nice new diagnostic device. It's a benchtop size. But I'm imagining that a bunch of those in a room might get problematic. They'd be a little bit big for the space you have. Very. <laughs> the, the clinic space, the room itself, is about 10 by 10. Okay. And then on top of the 10 by 10, you put millwork in and cabinets in, and you put an exam table in and a couple of chairs in, and maybe a light to look at into the ears or whatever. It starts to get really small. So when we're looking at our equipment, it really has to be something small, really something that can fit on a countertop. That's a really big piece for us. The other really big piece when we're looking at equipment is the ancillary supplies involved. So do those supplies need refrigeration? Mm -hmm. Most of our clinics are outfitted mm -hmm. with what you would think is like a dorm style refrigerator. It's small. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about vaccines, flu vaccine in particular, most vaccines need to be refrigerated. Mm -hmm. So if you have testing equipment that needs to be refrigerated, you're encroaching on the space that we're using to house our vaccines. So we need to really think about how much refrigeration do these testing supplies need, how big are these testing supplies, how much displacement are they going to use of our current supplies, mm -hmm. and, and those factors definitely go into what we're doing. I would say big analyzers that stand alone, they're not going to fit in our clinics. I mean, when you look at the clinic space now, in order for us to be compliant with the ADA and maintain wheelchair radius requirements and all the other pieces that we need to do, I mean, it's tight. And we're compliant with everything, but you could never put in a, a big you know, something that looks like a big Xerox copier, it would just never fit in the clinical space. So something that sits on the countertop would be perfect for us. Andrea, you've got a sort of different set of challenges. So you are trying to introduce point of care testing into a pharmacist workflow and they already have a full plate of things to do. In Alex's case, there are nurse practitioners and physician assistants whose job is patient care. But for your pharmacists, they already have different kinds of work to do. So how are you addressing their workflow problems? How are you making this enjoyable for them and worth it to them to add this to their work? Yeah. That's absolutely right. It is, you know, patient care is your workflow. Patient care can be a disruptor of workflow at, at the pharmacy. So I think that when we look at some of the point of care tests, we look at things like ease of use. The miniclinic provider does so many of these a week. They are just whipping them out and doing them. And a pharmacist may end up doing one or two a week depending on the volume of the pharmacy and where they're located. And so they need to be able to access it and not have to read instructions all over again each and every time because that's going to take more time away. I think the other thing that we do have the ability to do is the patient doesn't have to sit there for those 10 minutes and the pharmacist can go back to workflow. So during the development time of a test, the pharmacist goes back to workflow, the patient can walk the aisles, have a seat, and then they'll come back to them. So with our flu and strep pilot right now, it's a few steps of a process, an intake process, some vitals, a testing process, pharmacist is back in workflow, then it's back with consultation results and treatment options. So that in that respect, we have that ability to be able to go back and forth. I think we are working with our pharmacists to set patient expectations. So the expectation is, oh, I'm just going to come in and quickly get in and out of here with the pharmacy. And they'll definitely get in and out faster than they would in most doctor's offices. But setting the expectation that I might be in the middle of this or I might get a call while I'm uh, back in workflow. Do you think that this will increase the number of pharmacists you hire? Will you have more pharmacists on staff at any given point or at high volume times of day? I think that that really remains to be seen on how what kind of demand we get. And I think that's really the, the piece of the pilot for us is what is the patient appetite for these types of tests? 
doing time studies to understand, also looking at what role can the pharmacy tech play. In some states, the pharmacy techs uh, need to be certified. And in Michigan is one of the states in which pharmacy techs are moving towards certification. And those who are nationally certified are saying, this is great. Now we get to use our skills. And they're looking forward to participating in this. So it may not always need to be the pharmacist doing every piece of it and how you spread that work around. So we've already heard a lot at the conference about change management and changing expectations of an entire industry, changing expectations of a patient population or the payers. So I know the Minute Clinic has been around for more than 10 years, um, but Andrea, some of the work that you're doing, you're just piloting now. So what sorts of things do you both expect to be doing in terms of change management? How are you getting your staff on board? How are you educating patients to what is appropriate, what is available? Uh, and how are you getting payers on board to present to them which kinds of things that you can do and what you can bring to the table? On the Minute Clinic side, you know, I, I, I think that we have opportunities to do continue to do change management. I think that in some pockets of the country, Minute Clinic has been really well adopted, mm -hmm. and people use us almost as a secondary primary care provider, mm -hmm. and they'll come to Minute Clinic for just about anything. There are other pockets of the country who see Minute Clinic as a place you get your flu shot, mm -hmm. and then that's just about it. And I, I believe that there are some gaps in the knowledge in the general public of how much more we can do in the clinics beyond just a flu shot. How many disease states we can truly see in the clinics. Uh, I think there's opportunities there to continue to educate the public. I think on the payer side, we have additional opportunities. While we've been doing point of care testing in the clinics for a while now and we have general acceptance for the tests that we offer, I think there are other point of care tests out there that we would like to do that maybe would be a challenge with some payers. If you think about payers who have exclusive arrangements with reference labs. So they may pay for a strep test at the clinic because it's easy to do and it's right there and you can get your diagnosis right there with the strep test. Maybe other things like management of chronic disease, we would have a challenge getting paid for in our setting if a, if a payer has an exclusive with a reference lab because that work, you know, the change management is to say that this work doesn't have to be done at a reference lab. We can decentralize this lab work and we can do some of this point of care, you know, reasonable point of care wave testing in the clinic environment. And, and I believe that we have opportunities there to do change management with the payers. Uh, I, there are a lot of interdependencies as well with the payers. And I think that one of the things when we're bringing our pharmacists along into uh, the world of patient care, which it's not that they don't want to do it. Again, it's about how do I do it when I'm doing all these other things. And it's, it's really busy back there. The payer piece is going to be a piece of it because that validates the work that they do. And when we have the ability and we have payers who are reimbursing for the clinical consultation or for the covering the time and for the test, then that helps push the change management piece on the pharmacy team so that they're feeling like a valued member of the, of the medical community. From the patient perspective, it's really about us giving that good care. So if they come in and have a good experience, it's going to resonate. And if they come in and don't have a good experience, it's really going to resonate. And I think that's the piece on us, that we stay dedicated to the CVS health values of caring and integrity and, and making sure that that person feels really valued when they're coming in. And that, that's a big piece of it. In our hormonal contraception pilot in California, we had a patient who took to Facebook saying, I just had a great experience. I was able to do this and go in and out. And that's it. We know with social media now, this is where patient perceptions are shaped in, in many instances. And so I think this is going to be how we continue to make sure that our patients feel valued and, and see it as well. Thank you both so much. I've really enjoyed speaking with you.